Welcome everybody. Nice to see such a big crowd here on a talk about uh, automated testing together with uh, well, everyone's favorite butler. Has anybody spotted him already around there? Spotted some clues? I haven't seen him. Well, it can be missed if he's there, so looking forward to meeting him myself. Um, uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, a couple of best practices, small bits of theory, but really how to do proper uh, automated testing setup as part of, uh, part of Jenkins. Um, in the talk, I'll be covering uh, a couple of uh, couple of things. First of all, the way uh, I see, but we see, I think you can all experience the way that testing is done completely different in a world where CD is just uh, our second nature. So the real focus on, on testing and test automation is really important. How to do that properly. Uh, this basically means that we need to talk about two things. How to execute our tests uh, massively optimized, because speed is of the S essence but also how to really be able to analyze all the results that keep popping up here and there across all the tools that we might be using. So test automation and continuous delivery really falls out into execution and analysis. I will give a sh short uh, uh, automated testing 101, uh, focusing on the basics, but also quite a couple of best practices on how to properly set this up as part of the Jenkins initiative. Um, and I'll of, of course uh, uh, provide some summary and some of the new challenges we see out there, which we are also addressing, and some, uh, some thoughts for, uh, for follow-up. First of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Victor Clerk. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands, so I actually had uh, uh, the, the transfer from Heathrow Airport to the, to the hotel took longer than the flight from Amsterdam to London, which is interesting. Uh, but I, well, well, I manage, obviously. Uh, I work at TD Labs. Uh, I'm a product manager for a product called Excel Test View. Uh, my background is, is computer science. Uh, I've traversed mainly through all kind of phases in the software development life cycle, starting a waterfall from requirements analysis, requirements management, up until verification, doing uh, hard-coded software audits on the quality of uh, some Java uh, enterprise application at that time. Um, and recently I've been, uh, been uh, involved in, in the testing domain, in the automated testing domain, helping to support organizations setting up a, a proper, a clever testing strategy. Think about large multinational organizations, major banks that need to do with test data management, test execution, chain or end-to-end -end testing, and basically employing complete bunches of people, departments that basically take into account how to manage execution environments in which I run my end-to-end -end testing. Um, what I'm uh, trying to help here is to kind of lit a spark to see how we can also change uh, testing and the way we approach it perhaps not directly via you and your organization, but really, I see some really interesting stuff happening out there, so I'm really eager to, uh, to change the testing world. I see a, a world in which we do not have any, well, we have some place left for people who do manual testing, but we can get much and much out of uh, doing the stuff we, we do repeatedly by automating that, so we can really tend to the more specific stuff. And I think the Jenkins User Conference is about people uh, that can help uh, set up Jenkins proper, uh, in a proper way to really get that started to really allow people to get their hands free to do real available stuff. A um, couple words on TV Labs. Uh, we are an organization that builds uh, tools to support continuous delivery in large enterprises. So we have three products, Excel Release to manage your complete continuous delivery lifecycle from ID until release and production, being able to monitor that and model that as part of uh, different phases and activities and basically identify the waste in your delivery process. We have a tool called Excel Deploy, which allows you to do sophisticated, important, and challenging deploys across heterogeneous environments with lots of plugins to cloud vendors and all over the place. And as part of continuous delivery, test automation is key. So we also need to have a solution that keeps track of all the test results and uh, allows for qualification of those results and to be historic uh, across time, which is uh, covered by Excel Test View. So if you want more information, visit us at the booth. We're around here today and tomorrow. Um, what I see happening in the, in the, in the world out there is, uh, is quite, well, quite challenging. So take into account this really initial well, life cycle, kind of the fee model, but then flattened out from the left-hand side, starting with specifying the new stuff we need to build, and on the right-hand side, releasing it into production. Right? You can uh, distinguish in different phases from designing a solution, uh, designing a partial solution, building it, then testing it, uh, integration testing, regression testing, performance testing, installation testing, post-production testing, blah, 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 testing, all these kinds of testing activities which basically uh, keeps us away from getting software out there, right? So what we did over the past, well, tens of years is we uh, did the design-build-test phase. We tried to do it iteratively, so we use Scrum or other principles to 
uh, do uh, frequent deliveries out of our Scrum team every bi biweekly or, or, uh, or three weeks. Uh, but in the end, still the time we spend at the end of a sprint uh, demo until we get that stuff into production, especially in the heterogeneous environments, it really takes a lot of time. So what I've delivered in three weeks takes another three months before I can actually get it into production. This is kind of a shame. If I then take a look at how do people spend their testing effort, so the hours your organization might be spending in doing testing, this is, uh, this is the result, right? So the most time of, let's say, testing people, no offense, is spent in the phase where no real uh, value is added. Because all steps from integration up until user acceptance is not really about adding value because it's not about the new feature we build. We build a new feature as part of our sprint, and we need to test it there, but what we do at, at the end of every sprint, probably, well, you, you guys recognize it, I recognize it, at the last two days of the sprint, the, the team is testing, right? Lots of stuff, so, the, so every sprint deadline is being challenged because we need to do testing, because we do not do testing continuously as part of the sprint, build a progression set which we can then later on run automatically, so this needs to be changed in a, in a couple of ways. First of all, sparse start specification up front, using tools like uh, Cucumber, other uh, behavior-driven development tools, which you probably are familiar with, allow this to get the business analyst to write uh, acceptance tests in it, just like that. Actually, we, we can write those in a, in a form that, in which the business can understand it. So I call it acceptance-driven testing. Secondly, we need to maximize the time we spend on design, build, and testing, because there we are building new, new features. There we are making our new customers come to us instead of to our competitors. We are not losing money uh, because uh, uh, our competitors are not giving us any money. We need to get our, uh, our value at our customers. We need to do good delivery, we need to build uh, cool stuff. Which means that development is uh, becoming testing. So developers should become more test oriented because they need to get the feedback out of the automated tests. Developers too are also not happy when they see they don't meet their sprint. They will not blame the tester. Traditionally, they would, but then the tester would also like to be part of in engaging and empowering software developers to really do testing, not just once a night, but 10 times a day or 100 times a day. Every hour wasted because I do not have the feedback onto the quality of what I'm delivering is a wasted minute, right? So testing becomes more development oriented, which also means that the tester should be more knowledgeable on tools and how to set that up. Well, this obviously has Jenkins written all over it because we need to run this test automatically at every commit. But not just a unit test, but also see if we can get the performance test in there and get all the phases which are now on the right hand side to really pull them in and run them as part of a sprint. So get rid of these phases. They don't add value. They are valuable because basically this means does the new stuff doesn't it break anything of the existing stuff. So it is valuable, but we're not getting new features by means of that. So we're really ultimate, ultimate, ultimate the hell out of it. So, and then user acceptance tests, basically what I, if I'm really in a bad mood, I just say the, the dedicated user acceptance test phase of let's say three weeks before we go to production is basically an open invitation to people to dislike what we've done, right? We allow them, we invite them, and then we will say, well, mm, don't really like it. Mm -hmm. So then, what do you do then, right? So are you then delaying a release or whatever? This is kind of putting the challenge in the wrong, wrong spot. So really get this as part of the development cycle, getting users not only involved at sprint demos, but continuously uh, get the feedback is something we need to do all over the place. So this then will result in a kind of testing effort in the ideal situation, which kind of looks like this. We're doing much and much more testing as part of sprint continuously. And our, uh, uh, the effort we spend during uh, the regression testing phase or the or the integration testing phase, or the installation testing phase, is really reduced to a minimum. So this means that we need automation, right? We are not, the bottleneck testing will not be the bottleneck because we will need to wait until the test results before we can get the go live advice. This is really a problem. So automate it to get all the results at your fingertips. This also means that developers are becoming testers. The, the, the increase of code base, basically we're building twice as much production code. We build the code that does the stuff at our customers, we also build the, the code that tests the stuff that we give to our customers. Right? So we need to uh, maintain our test code as part of our source code. Test codes might be even more valuable than your production code, you might want to say. At the same time, if we run different kinds of testing space in, in parallel, massively automated, 
we are needing to get on-demand pipelines and environments to run my tests. Is there, there's no use to getting the performance test environment out there running continuously uh, and, uh, and not being able to really swap that. We need to manage our infrastructure as part of code. Uh, which parts should I use now to run my, my cross-browser tests? Do I have Selenium, test, uh, Selenium Grid for all my, my website testing? Uh, what about this dedicated performance environment? Is it really useful? I just, if, if I were able to really quickly set up an environment, load it with data, deploy my application onto it, run my tests, get the results, and then tear down that environment, then I, I'm much more flexible in really using the hardware as a, as a service to our software delivery process. At the same time, hosted services are also happening in a lot of places. We use cloud service providers here and there, uh, being able to integrate that. Crossing organizational borders are also some of the trends we need to take into account. So this is, this is happening, um, and this is also causing challenges. So I'm, well, I, I am saying that we should automate the hell out of everything, automate as much as possible, but at the same time, this also uh, poses a new kind of challenges. So, for instance, uh, a question based on all the results I'm seeing popping up from the different tools, like Fitness, uh, like JMeter, like Gatling, uh, like Cucumber, like HP, QS, QTP, or UFT, or whatever it's called, are we good enough to go live? If we want to take go live decisions at the speed of light, we need to understand all of the results. And then even further, uh, uh, right now I'm making a statement to go live at the end of every sprint. I don't want to wait two weeks to go live. I would like to go live as soon as a certain added value feature is, is delivered. So go live every couple of hours. But how do I then know that I've run the adequate tests that really can satisfy that I can indeed go live with that feature? Um, support for failure analysis. Probably uh, you or your organization are familiar with the following case. I, uh, as a developer, I, uh, I uh, did my build. I, uh, I checked, uh, checked in the source code. And in, over the weekend, uh, the build uh, turns red. Where at, on my machine, well, my machine didn't work, right? So then Monday morning, I really, uh, uh, well, I, I dragged myself to work because I need to find out what went wrong. So what was the difference in the environment in which I ran the, the mighty test over the weekend? Uh, as compared to the environment in which I run the test Friday afternoon, which it succeeded. What went wrong? So really, if we're able to then, by means of all this automated testing, to also capture the context in which we run the tests, that can help us to analyze the failures, which can also it will increase the productivity of all our developers. Think about every bug, every team member spending 10 minutes on, well, apply the math and really see how much time we are wasting in the sprint. We can really massively op optimize there. And then my test set is growing, right? So I've grown from 10 to 100 to thousands of tests. More is better, right? So, but then it's really about how to make the proper subset of the tests that I need to run at this, this time. Which tests add, add most value? Which tests are superfluous? How to really make sense of all the results? Um, and how to also support this growing set of tests where it probably will not make sense to have uh, good features in production but I can only test that by running a big nightly test which kind of uh, expands across the boundaries of the night. So uh, supporting tests that run over eight and a half hours. So really this offers a new class of problems. So we're not talking about John Doe who is the bottleneck because he has to do all the manual testing. Once we've automated, we're building on lots and lots of automated tests and now we need to uh, find clever ways of managing uh, all that stuff. And of course we can use Jenkins for it. But at the same time, what we see in, in most of the Jenkins set of we've come across, we see different test jobs which cover different, uh, different aspects. Really understanding to make proper selections by parameter passing, by, by doing, uh, doing partial builds, by seeing what, when do I qualify a build as failed or not, or, or a test job as failed or not. This is something which is, uh, is a bit stretching. So this butler is getting can kind of squeeze into all kinds of sweet spots. And of course, we heard about the, the workflow plugin and other cool stuff. And there's pl plugins out there, but still we're kind of kind of tweaking in using plugins in each individual job. And really, what we need to do is we need to find a way to, to get uh, get the big picture clear. So uh, w we see some challenges here, and uh, it's also interesting to uh, to discuss with you guys to see how you uh, how you see this. Um, what is important is by means of automation, we need to be able to uh, cleverly execute tests, but also be able to analyze the results. Mm -hmm. Because only then we can make sophisticated go live decisions. Really on the side note, you can also say, well, I'm only, only, I only want to go live as soon as I have no failing tests. So who is that principle? 
One, two, three, right? So, so okay, so most of us go live with some failing tests, right? Yeah, yeah, I probably hate to admit it, but, but that's in the case, right? So how do we then properly analyze all the test results? When are we good enough to go live? These are the challenges we need to address. So we're focusing on efficient pipeline execution, how to run our tests massively in parallel, but how to really understand uh, uh, what we're delivering if we don't understand what is failing, right? So we need to make testing and, and the quality aspect a, a first-class citizen of your CD initiative, uh, but also get a sense of reality in. So if we see some failing tests, or let's say how do I value performance test results, completely different ball game, need to really model that realistically. So uh, what we're uh, proposing right now is to also add the second phase to the CD uh, uh, equation, also focus on analysis, right? Execution is, uh, is about speed, Analysis could be about quality, right? How to really understand all the results. So speed is about pipeline orchestration, but what are the tools that we can use to get quality? So we have this automated test, we have these automated test results popping in as soon as possible at the, at the speed of light. How to really make sense of that? And this, well, two years ago I was at this, uh, this large major Dutch bank who said, well, 20 plus scrum teams developing a new online, online banking experience and uh, heavily making use of fitness as a testing tool and also Cucumber as a testing tool and I was thinking, well, hmm, why not just standardize? We also had QTP and stuff like that. Whatever. And then I saw another team popping up and they, they told me, about, well, we just uh, selected the tool and it's called JBehave. So we started using JBehave, another testing tool. I said, well, oh, what's going on? There is a myriad of testing tools out there and, and my first response really at that time was, well, why don't they just see what their neighbors are using? Why don't they also use Cucumber? And then at some point, at some point I thought, well, this is kind of a problem because I'm kind of delaying or, or denying these teams the freedom which we are propagating in an agile setting, right? We use our own tools, a process over tools, blah, blah, blah. Um, so there will be multiple tools out there for functional testing, for performance testing, for source code quality, for load testing, for stress testing, for blah, blah, blah. So we might as well find a way to really keep track of all the results. There will not be a situation in which we just use a single test tool which is out there. Face it. So how to understand and get quality insight across all those tools. First, a couple of uh, basics. So the, the small uh, small testing 101. Who's familiar with the Cones pyramid? Ah, oh, thanks, 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 thank you. Okay, so what, the, what this is saying is how do I, when I'm doing automated testing, where, do, where should I spend my time? The main principle of continuous delivery is to fail fast, right? Every, every problem I see later on the chain is costing me much and much more money in, in terms of wasted uh, uh, development resources, so I need to fail fast. So if I take a uh, well, artificial distinction between the kind of testing I'm running, automated, uh, I can think about unit testing, service testing, and uh, graphical user interface testing. Turning them upside down, we get, get, uh, get into a pyramid, and basically what Cohen is saying, you should put most emphasis in getting the unit tests right. So unit test coverage is more important than all your paths throughout the user interface because you cannot touch all functionality in your system by just using some click paths through your user interface. Moreover, unit tests run really quickly. Graphical user t interface tests, they run quickly because they're automated and you can see all these kind of screens flickering, but they're really, really slow. If you have a substantial organization and, and, and applications running your, your, uh, your Selenium tests, really they're slow. You need to do that, but they are slow. So, uh, and then later on, we also do some integration testing and some performance testing, but really focus on the basics first. So try to fail as quickly as possible and get the development team to write, uh, uh, write tests and get the tester as part of the development team to also support a writing test, to ask the right questions, to really build up a solid, uh, solid base. And this happened, well, it's possible because testers are becoming developers, right? At the same time, uh, we are building uh, development code and uh, test code, and we should kind of apply Conway's law to, uh, to testing code. So Conway's law states, it's uh, from the 60s, Conway's law states the, the, the structure of an organization is mimicked in the structure of the source code, so take your organizational chart and take your, 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 your uh, package hierarchy and you, you see the resemblance. I think we also should also apply that to test codes, that the structure of your system is kind of mimicked also in the structure of your test code that test, is testing that system. So you can 
can it be the right balance between which parts of the code is covered by which part of the test code? Right? And also be able to measure quality. Am I putting most of my testing effort and also tests on the functionality that is most critical to me? Right? There's, everybody can write passing unit tests. But do we write the passing unit tests that make sense on the most important topics? Right? So this is important. So we need to kind of have metrics there to really get that insight. At the same time, uh, linking tests to use cases. Probably, uh, well, modern system development uh, occurs via user stories or use cases or, or features. And do we have a clear link between which tests cover which features? This is Conway's law in action. That we can really make proper selections, proper subsets of running, running only those tests that are for a certain feature. Well, it's not a real good excuse, but Google does it this way, right? So, and they are successful in something. Um, at the same time, uh, when this ever-growing uh, set of tests is, uh, is occurring, we need to also be able to, to make proper subselection. So how to apply uh, stuff like labeling, and I will give a couple of examples of that to really make sense and to really select the right amount of tests across uh, uh, out of your big, uh, big, uh, big set of tests. Um, and we need to radically parallelize. Right? I will give some examples of that as well, uh, because we, need, we can always fail faster. Right? And this is important. So modern software development, uh, there's, there's teams that are doing the test automation setup using Jenkins, using uh, a Jenkins uh, farm, using, uh, using slaves. And then they are, they are trying to get the feedback time from five minutes to two minutes, because we're saving an extra three minutes in a build, which is saving time. So this, we can always do it faster. And there's people that say, well, I, I, I probably can just skip a couple of, couple of tests. And I think in some perspective that makes sense because you don't need to run superfluous tests that are always green or when they're red, you're not atten attending to them. So just skip them. But other school of thought says, well, no, if, if running all the tests takes slower, you need to speed it up. You should always run all your tests. And uh, who runs nightly tests? We should stop doing that. <laughs> right? This is, this is because if I'm developing a feature from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. and then uh, I will have to wait until the, the nightly test running, so which is a delay of 10 or, or 15 hours before I get feedback. Stop doing nightly tests. It's not it's not needed anymore. Stop it. <laughs> Come on. Okay. So uh, a bit, bit more about Conway's law. So uh, let test code mimic the production code, right? So suppose we have an organization uh, which develops a, a system on the test. And we have a hierarchy in, in, our, in our functional tests, and most of the tools out there that support some kind of hierarchy. So we have a bit, our big fat uh, test suite, which covers a couple of apps. And in an app, we have use case, and a use case consists of a number of test cases. So again, here, if we have the most important use case, we can count the number of test cases in a use case to kind of see if we're on the right track. We're not putting our money into stuff which isn't relevant. Um, so at some point, if we are doing proper test setup, and I will get to that later, we might as well cut the suite at the use case. So we have a whole bunch of, let's say, 50 or 100 use cases. And we can massively parallelize execution of those use cases. We can only do that if our test code is not spaghetti code. Right? Because otherwise, we're depending on each other. And we're still having to well, basically revert back to the Nike because we need that 10-hour time, time window to run on my test. Really, so proper test setup is important. It's a prerequisite to do this which means the tests should not depend on other tests. So setting up and tearing down of test data should be done as part of the test. For, from a performance test perspective, this is challenging. Yes, because we need to do load testing and stress testing, so we need to populate a database with lots and lots of data. But from a functional test perspective, every test should be able to prepare its own data and then basically return back to the previous state at the end of the test. Sharing of test components. It has called them fixtures. So there's other uh, other tools out there that did different names. Really reuse code, like code that tests a login component or to test a shopping cart component or whatever we're developing. We can really do that. And again, here it's just like programming. We need to balance the, the fact between more and more code duplication uh, um, and easy fixtures or easy uh, uh, easy parts or really sophisticated test code with the duplication minimized. Um, this is testing and becoming development activities, we should just treat it as, as such. Also, the architecture of your test system is very, very important. So, focus on functional coverage, not technical coverage. 
So here's the, the stuff I mentioned already. Do I have relatively more tests for the more important user stories? And how do I link tests to user stories, features, and fixes? And uh, suggestions for metrics we, you, we should get out of our, our continuous delivery setup is how much tests am I running? What is the number of tests that didn't, didn't pass in the last hour or last day or last, uh, last week? Which tests are most flaky? Anybody knows what flaky tests are? So tests that really uh, turn state from red to green unexpectedly, right? So if I change part of, of the source code and I run a test, I might expect a, 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 a change. But if I am making no apparent change to, to my system under test, and still test state is, is, uh, is switching, yeah, probably don't want to take the go live decision based on these flaky tests. So really, what, what tests are most flaky is something really we should attend to. And apparently, it could point to environment settings or connectivity issues or whatever. But really, this is a bottleneck number one. And at the same time, focus on the duration. Even with functional automated tests, taking into account the increasing duration trend is something which is important. Because it could point to, well, hey, you should now just get uh, Kosuka's data center and buy more stuff because we need to run more in parallel because our tests are getting slower. So um, these are a couple of examples which every organization should get out of their automated tests. And what we see in, in major Jenkins setups is we see different test jobs using different tools and different plugins, like I mentioned earlier, in which we are able to, uh, to get that feedback. Um, but typically, uh, uh, the role of the test automation engineer who is responsible for the sanity of all these test jobs across the different pipelines is something which should be much more important because the test automation engineer is the eyes and the ears of your continuous delivery initiative, I think. So about slicing and dicing, so really keeping the, the test code manageable. What we could do, and we've seen a couple of examples at uh, some of our customers as well, is that, uh, and this is kind of, well, putting it out in the open, that. Uh, 20 plus Scrum teams, each team has a couple of features they are primarily responsible for and also the associated tests responsible for that. So if somebody touches part of the code and breaks some kind of test, we know who to go to. We also label tests uh, by means of topic. So which functional area or, or, uh, or cross-cutting concern is this test aimed to? So running all the performance tests or running all the, uh, the checkout tests. Um, what would also be possible if if we were able to annotate tests with uh, tests that are known to be flaky because of history. So I really should pay attention, and everybody's kind of circumventing that part, but somebody really should take care of that to really see what's going wrong there. And at some, some point you could also say, uh, I know certain tests are failing, we know that there's an issue, we would like to mark or label them as such, really place them in a separate category so that they're not taken into account into a potential go no go decisions in which because these tests are failing but we know and we accept that blah blah blah. And you could think of other categories as well, but what we did at some organizations we supported a, a solution in which uh, uh, these organizations are able to uh, assign labels to tests, allowing them to make proper selections and, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, able to do the right um, role running in parallel, the right moment in time, getting the right tests out of this big bunch of more than 7,000 or 20,000 automated tests. This could help to really make it, uh, make it manageable. Then on the execution part. So again, the, the pyramid. So what we do as a guiding principle for our test automation setup in, in Jenkins, we should tilt the pyramid and start running unit test, service test, and UI tests. So the idea is that if I have less UI tests, running them takes relatively little amount of time. And if I'm placing much more emphasis on getting the right unit tests and service tests, I should I would probably have more of them, and I should run them more often and more early. Right? So take a look at your Jenkins, whether you have the pipeline plugin or whatever kind of plugin, see how your, your test pyramid is reflected in your Jenkins setup. What we also should do is we should well, create uni unique artifact fingerprints to really monitor what we're pushing across our pipeline. I think I, what I like about Kusuka's talk is you really treat everything as code. So every build, every, uh, every artifact should be labeled so you know what you're putting out, uh, out there. And you're also able to report on it. Again, uh, it, this is not a problem if I'm just testing uh, well, every, every release, every couple of weeks. If I'm testing 10 or 20 times a day, I'm getting all this data, so I need to be able to make sense out of it. Then uh, if we're involved in cross-browser testing, 
Um, you might also want to say, well, I'd like to run every possible operating system browser combination out there. But probably this is not feasible because it will take too much time. So then I will create a Jenkins job which is labeled do the, do the browser test, and then I can feed it with a parameter for doing a Chrome test or a Safari test or whatever test. Just make different jobs for them. So you, can, you really need, don't need to take care of how you run them in parallel or not. Just create, create uh, extra jobs for it. And there's a couple of plugins out there which are able to uh, speed up stuff. So I just added the workflow plugin there because it's out there. Uh, to be able to copy and to sophisticate and manage your, your Jenkins uh, pipeline to, uh, to uh, do more proper uh, uh, pipeline handling. Um, more tips. So keep Jenkins jobs uh, sane and simple. Uh, again, uh, with the workflow plugin, we saw the DSL, which you can just make part of your source code. Also, make all the stuff you're executing, make it part of your source code. So then, not just you can check it out and you can change, but also the development team is responsible for it. So also, your complete Jenkins setup is something which is managed by a team. Right? Uh, also, always parameterize uh, shell scripts, so shell scripting 101. And use the parameters like nightly test, performance test, uh, shopping cart test, uh, uh, blah 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 test and, and use that as parameters by instructing your uh, your test jobs. At some point you might want to run all your tests. Let's do it just once a month, just because the boss wants. But in most of the times I'm running only the tests I need to run massively in parallel to speed up time. So I need to be able to make those selections and if I have my, prop my tests properly annotated, I can make the selections by feeding in the parameters. And we should do it as code. Um, Shell scripts placed on the first control and managed by the team. I think I mentioned it already. So example, um, example drug distribution from build on the left hand side to uh, running my performance tests late in the chain because they take too much time, uh, and then uh, see whether we were really able to go live. And with this example setup, I'm running a couple of browser tests, and this is fine. But as my number of browsers is, is uh, becoming uh, bigger, then I I need to parallelize. So what I'm doing right now is I. Uh, download one of the plugins, I install them and run my browser tests in parallel. And then I will get some logic in there that's saying I can only enter the performance test stage as soon as all the browser tests are succeeding. Right? And then later on I'm adding another browser, a couple of browser tests, I'm uh, creating more interface tests. So this notion of um, when am I okay enough to go to the next stage is something which is important, it's becoming more and more a challenge. If I'm increasing the well, the sophisticatedness of my pipeline, I will get scattered result qualification because I cannot afford myself to run all my stuff uh, uh, serialized, so se sequentially. So I need to do stuff in parallel, I need to keep track of the results. So then, how to uh, do test distribution across jobs? So parallelization, 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 right? So get your environment, run your tests, and then throw them away happily, right? We think we can dockerize stuff, we can just Pull up a new Docker multi container and run it. Make it shrink wrap. Make your jobs also independent, like your well, like your production code, like your test code, also your Jenkins configuration. It is just code. Make it uh, uh, not dependent on other jobs. And focus on the duration and focus on the health of the job. So if jobs are taking more and more time, if executing tests are taking more and more time as part of the jobs, really. So you should never be satisfied with that. You should always try to speed it up and get the downward trend that you're, you're speeding up jobs, then you're doing a good job, I think. So what about this? Even, even more parallelized, right? So after deploy, I just get my stuff, get my, my release out to a completely number of different environments, which we just created seconds before that. And then I'm running my integration test, I'm, I'm running my browser test, I'm running some kind of performance test, all in parallel. From a complete uh, duration perspective, I reduce time uh, massively. But then again, I see lots of uh, tick marks on the right hand side. So when, when am I good enough to go live, right? Only when all is done. Well, we just checked that I think 1% of the audience here goes live when all tests, when there are no failing tests, right? So reality is that we, are, we have failing tests, but if it's just, let's say, the the Safari blah 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 browser test, which uh, we know from experience that only 2% of our, our customer base is using. We might as well accept some failures or some scroll bar not appearing there, right? So, of course, we have tested that signal that issue, but we might want to be able to accept that. So, again, proper or clever annotation of the results is really becoming important. So, here, actually, I was kind of surprised because Sokka didn't put in a screenshot of, of the workflow plugin. This is the workflow plugin in the stage view of that. 
allows you to get different uh, pipes in there and also do uh, do qualification of the results. And uh, about two weeks ago, we gave a, a webinar together with CloudBeast showing how to do proper result qualification uh, with the Jenkins plugin uh, asset. I think there's a link at the end of the presentation. It would be interesting to see what you think of it. Uh, but this is, I think, important, getting oversight across the different jobs and uh, making sense of the results. Because we need to do proper test analysis. So we've talked a lot about right now about execution, doing stuff in parallel by means of uh, uh, tagging and independent, uh, independent jobs. How about the second phase of continuous delivery, which is about analysis. How to make sense of the test results and how to support uh, real go no go decisions, right? So the first one is the obvious one, I only go live or I proceed to the next stage when there's no failing test. Other customers might say, well, I would allow to uh, have 5% of failing tests. Even more realistically, combined with the, with the last one, I would allow for 5% of failing tests, except of this list of 31 tests, which I think are most critical, because they cover the core functionality of, of our product. So our qualification algorithm that then becomes as soon as one of the 31 uh, critical tests is failing, I, I fail. If not, I will count the percentage uh, of failing tests, and if it's not exceeding 5%, I'm good enough to go live. Right? Um, or even, even, I think, more interestingly, if I'm in a stage where I'm accepting failing tests, I know that I have failing tests, but I would like to improve. I would then would like to have a qualification which reads, well, as soon as there's one, test that is failing right now, which passed previously, I have a regression, and then I'm failing. Tests that are, that are failing yesterday and are, are failing today as well, okay, well, we know we're not there yet, but as soon as I have a regression, I would like to hit the brake. This is more realistic uh, going about decision making, I think. What we need to do here is not just from a, from a functionality perspective, but also from a performance perspective, we need to take into account historical context. We need to, we can do that within our Jenkins jobs, but you also need to do that across Jenkins jobs to spot trends before they become a problem. So how do I qualify a performance test results? Right, right or wrong in performance testing is something which is, which is more fine grained, right? So it's about average duration of uh, performing a certain kind of load and spotting not a too severe performance degradation in that trend. I'm not talking about right or wrong here, but we need to make sense of the results. So, um, we need to have one integrated view, and we need to make the go live decision uh, based on all the test results because they lay there at our fingertips. We don't want to delay until, let's say, the Friday afternoon release meetings, in which lots of different people from lots of different organizations, departments come together with lots of reports and lots of gut feeling, and then they will, let's try and go live, right? No, we need to automate that process as well, and I think we can do that. So, um, executing Jenkins. Uh, I mentioned a couple of critical notes. Uh, different testing jobs will have their different, uh, different uh, plugins, which can uh, allow us to make sense of it, but most of the plugins allow to traverse across history within a job, right? So um, marking a build as passing or as failing or as unstable is perhaps uh, too coarse because we might also want to induce this the state of known, uh, known failures. So what about modeling the past but with known failure state in, in our genuine jobs? Right? These, these, are, these are the challenges which are, which are popping up right now. And, um, well, a bit of summarizing, the ultimate analysis question is, are, are we good enough to go live? And of course, everybody has an opinion, but really, is it backed by data? Well, typically not, right? So any solutions for that. A um, couple of examples. So what we, uh, what we did at uh, one customer is to work with them to basically do a bit of a counterexample as the stuff I just explained, because this organization, major online Dutch webshop, they had uh, one big fitness hierarchy consisting of more than 7,000 tests, in which they model all their tests for their webshop. And they adhere to this example structure. So one webshop suite, then a couple of uh, subsuites, and then use cases. In the use case 1500 has, I think, seven test cases, which cover that, that use case. So, they started using uh, running nightly tests from the beginning. So this is again a reality, right? I just said kill the nightly, but they're still out there. Um, and, and running only those tests that have the label nightly to, to run. Um, first, uh, uh, everything was done sequentially, but then we really hit the boundary of, uh, well, about 10 hours uh, of duration of this running, uh, running test set suite. And then we were able to, uh, to get the, the parallelization up running to be able to cut it at the, at the subsuite level and run all the use cases in parallel across 
I think, an average on 35 Jenkins slaves. So one dedicated job that allows for the cutting of the complete suite and handing out the jobs to each individual Jenkins slaves and then collecting back the results and making sense of it. So another example which you might want to do is really more heterogeneous example of how this looks into an example pipeline setup. So in this perspective on the top, we again, we see from the left-hand side the code review as a first quality measure before we even check in code, and then build unit tests, build the archive, deploy it, and run some smoke tests. And we see, of course, our core butler spanning across the complete uh, chain, and we see Git, we see Maven, Fitness, uh, we see a deployment tool, we see your artifact repository. And what we did here is we um, support deployments to dedicated team servers. So the bottom right hand side says we had at every, each of the 20 scrum teams a dedicated server in which they could do deployments and pilot on their own to get the feedback without moving to all kinds of integration environments up front. Because yes, this was an organization with a whole bunch of uh, integrated testing. So then what we did is we uh, designed a couple of steps in parallel. So what we see here on the left hand side, we see the testing phase, so system testing and production acceptance testing from a functional perspective. In the middle we see uh, security testing, and in the bottom we see source code quality testing. And this is kind of interesting, because I think it's different as to most organizations do it. What we said here, or we discussed here, is how, how likely are you to fail a build or fail your software pipeline because your source code is of insufficient quality. Hey, I would be more interested in first learning about some functionality, some functional tests, and then later take the source code quality into the equation. So you are able to, whether it's right or wrong, we can have lots and lots of debates on that. Come to the booth and let's start the discussion. You have lots and lots of discussion how to really optimize your pipeline, when to place what part of your testing. Right? So there are, there are variances that you, you can take into account there. At the end, before, because there was obviously a, a big dev versus ops uh, uh, movement going on there, um, the ops guys need to know they have the source code quality checks in there because before we could move to the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, testing environment, um, deploy to a chain environment and running all kinds of smoke testing and, and chain testing. And those were expensive again. So we tried to minimize the amount of time spent, uh, spent there. So what we also did for all the fitness tests is we collected some proper scripting to get all the results together, based on which we were able to make uh, dashboards, saying, well, hey, these are the integrated views of all my test results. We see uh, which team is responsible for it. We see which browser is where we're running. And we're even able to create uh, reporting, basically showing the percentage of failed tests per team. So the horizontal axis show the different teams in this organization. And we don't take, take into account the absolute number of tests, because small parts of the system might require less number of tests. But we do so aggregate it to 100% and see which team has most failed tests. So these are the kind of solutions which, which need to be out there if we are involved in test automation, which we need to do because we are involved in continuous delivery, which we need to do because we need to get our software to production at the speed of life, right? So summarizing, um, testing is automation. Testers are developers, whether you face it or not, whether people run away crying or not, but testers will become developers. This is happening. Uh, structuring and annotating tests. Uh, Conway's law for testing, we discussed that and be able to radically parallelize the execution. And we need to do that by uh, keeping our Jenkins jobs and our test code uh, same, clean, and not dependent on anything else, which is actually on the next sheet. Um, Invoke tests using plugins, uh, using parameterization, and using massive uh, parallelization. So I think these are the most important takeaways. Um, again, summarizing. Continuous delivery is about speed and quality, it's about execution of your test jobs and about analysis. Uh, making sense of all the scanning results across Jenkins jobs is still a challenge, and we need a way to figure out uh, how to address real world uh, going on decisions. Um, yeah, you might have, uh, some links for, for future reference. Uh, we, uh, uh, the, the Cloud Beach uh, webinar I mentioned, uh, we did uh, two weeks ago, showing some examples of how to. Uh, properly tie up uh, qualification uh, uh, possibilities in your, your Jenkins setup. We have a white paper available and also uh, a product available which might be able to, to help you with, but also visit us at the booth and, uh, and uh, let's uh, continue the discussion. So thanks for now, probably we have some time left for questions. One or two. Like two minutes. Like two minutes <laughs> questions, oh, sorry for that. Yeah. So hit me.